The scientists today, as they think about this field, uh, it is so new, the idea is so new, that they've yet to agree even on a single term. Some scientists call this the quantum hologram. Uh, some call it nature's mind. Dr. Ed Mitchell, former Apollo astronaut, calls this nature's mind. Uh, scientists like Stephen Hawking call it the mind of God. As varied as the names appear to be, they're all speaking about essentially the same field, and they describe this field as a web or a net that underlies the fabric that links everything together. And it is this fabric, this web, this net, is what we speak to with the feelings in our bodies, with the feelings in our hearts. Ancient traditions not only recognized this relationship, they invite us one step further and they left precise instructions in terms of how we apply this in our lives. In the late 1980s, I was an engineer working in the defense and aerospace corporations. I began exploring these concepts as an engineer, looking in the world around me to understand the history of those who have come before us. And it is that thinking that led me into the journeys of some of the most amazing places in the world, from the temples in Egypt, the Andes Mountains in Bolivia and Peru, uh, in the India and Nepal, the highlands of central China and Tibet, all through the American desert southwest. Searching for information and clues that would help us to understand how we relate to the world and how we can use this, this power of feeling, this power uh, that speaks the language, the world around us. So as an engineer, when I began studying the principles of those who have come before us, the information that they left so that we could understand our relationship to the world around us and, uh, and this ancient technology that today we call prayer. My thinking was that this kind of information would be best preserved in places that have been least disturbed by Western civilization. Uh, and this thinking led me into a journey, uh, first time in 1998, into the highlands of central China, into Tibet where we had the opportunity to explore 12 monasteries and two nunneries, speaking through the translators to those who actually live these principles in their lives. And this is the value of going to a place like Tibet, a living culture. We can go into temples in Egypt or temples, or the Mayan temples in the Yucatan, and as fascinating as they are and as much information as they hold, the cultures that left that kind of information no longer exist. So at very best, we are speculating in terms of what they're saying to us. When we go into a monastery in Tibet, we can actually speak with the people who are there. We can ask them, when we see your prayers on the outside, what are you doing on the inside? What happens? What happens to your body? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you emoting? Well, it was in Tibet where I had the opportunity to meet with an abbot of one of the monasteries. And I asked him through the translator, same thing we'd ask all of the monks and all of the nuns, and it was his answer that was so clear to me. And I, I asked him, when we see your prayers for 12 and 14 and 16 hours a day, when we see the mudras and the mantras and the bells and the bowls and the gongs and the chimes and the chants that you're doing in your prayers for so long on the outside, I said, what are you doing on the inside? What happens on the inside? And the abbot looked at me, and I like to think he was laughing with me, or he may have been laughing at me, because he said through the translator again, he said, you've never seen our prayers, because a prayer cannot be seen. 